And when you when I say get to your seats, there is no requirement for you to sit in front of me. That you can see the screens. We have a, a general key up on two different screens. So whatever works best uh, for you to uh, hear and see. Uh, General Key, I, I have to compliment Troy uh, Montgomery on the uh, improvements they've made to the sound system and to the uh, projection system. So uh, uh, thank you all. And uh, uh, as always, uh, we owe a great debt of thanks uh, to them uh, because uh, they don't charge us to have our meetings here. And that's that's a big deal uh, for us right now. Well, uh, before I uh, introduce General Key, uh, who's been so kind to join us tonight. Let me make a couple of administrative announcements. Uh, first of all, it looks like the 30th of April will um, convene again, and the 30th of April in the civic room downstairs. In this case, we will have the um, State Department advisor from uh, Air University uh, giving a presentation, uh, Mr. Steers Gonzalez, and he'll be giving a presentation on Latin America. Uh, more to come on refining the topic, but we're we're trying, as you can tell from this presentation and from the Latin American uh, presentation, we're trying to kind of spread out um, and uh, look at a few more areas in the world that we haven't visited lately. And uh, what was the first name? Steers Gonzalez, is that right? Yeah. Terry. Terry Steers Gonzalez. Okay. Uh, and then on the 14th of May, we are looking at having our regional uh, trips uh, report in. Uh, and again, right now we're scheduled to uh, for the civic room downstairs uh, for that presentation. I've also had an offer that we will need to consider, uh, but that I think could uh, end up uh, giving us a little bit more exposure. Certainly, Zoom has helped us uh, reach a larger crowd, uh, but uh, Troy uh, Television, Trojan Vision, has uh, approached me about possibly arranging to rebroadcast uh, presentations uh, on uh, the, their uh, Trojan Vision channel, which is also a public access channel. So give us even a, a greater exposure, which again, details to follow but um, uh, potentially an exciting development there for our, our uh, programs. Well, it's my great pleasure uh, to have tonight as our guest, uh, Major General Retired Randy Church Key. I don't know, I, I, I wonder whether the younger, uh, you know, Air Force, when you say Church Key, why, why is his name Church? You know, it's, you have to be of a certain age, I guess, to really, <laughs> to appreciate that. Uh, who is a personal friend, and I was so glad to find out that he was going to be able to present to us and have his chance uh, to interact with him. He is currently uh, in Alaska as the director of the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies. And again, in line with that theme now, looking beyond uh, just the places where we've looked and uh, uh, we, we can ill ignore, as you'll find from uh, uh, General Key's presentation, we can ill ignore the Arctic, especially given the rise in the tensions now, uh, and the, uh, that that is going to be an area uh, where we're going to we're going to be bumping up against people. And I'll leave it to him, obviously, to to talk about that. Now he's well equipped to do this. He didn't just stay in a Holiday Inn Express and then take over the uh, Arctic Security uh, Studies program. He was previously a commissioner of the U.S. Arctic uh, Research Commission. Uh, based at the University of Alaska at Anchorage. And then during 2016 to 2021, 20, uh, he was executive director of the Arctic Domain Awareness Center at the University of Alaska, which is a designated center of excellence in maritime research. Now, let me back up to what the, and he's going to tell you more about the Ted Stevens Center. That is a DOD, Department of Defense, regional center. So it's, it's got a very formal role, and I'm going to leave it to him to talk more about that. Uh, but I was actually, I was fascinated when I started reading about that and, and very encouraged, glad that we had that. <clears throat> now, um, prior to uh, uh, getting into to this, he was had a 30-plus uh, year uh, military career. I had the great privilege to serve with him uh, uh, on a couple of assignments during that. He led at the squadron, group, wing, and air ops center level. 
His staff assignments included U.S. Transportation Command, uh, the Air Staff, Headquarters U.S. Air Force, and the Joint Staff uh, in both operations plus strategic plans and policy directorates. He has contributed to U.S. Arctic strategy, supported domain awareness technology development, and defense support to Arctic crisis response. He culminated his military service as Director of Strategy, Policy, Planning, and Capabilities for the U.S. European Command in Stuttgart, Germany. He is also a Global Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center Polar Institute, a network member of the North American Antarctic Defense and Security Network at Trent University, Ontario, and the lead for a working group for the Naval Research International Cooperative Engagement Program for Polar Research. Let's give a warm welcome to Major General Randy Church Key. Um, thank Over you, sir. To you, sir. Okay, my dear friend. Thank you, Waldo. Uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, first of all, I'll just bring you greetings from uh, Joint Base Elmador Richardson, Alaska, and the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies. It's a great joy uh, to be able to present to you today. It's a great uh, sorrow that I'm not there in person. I'd like to give my, my uh, shout out to uh, Major General Gavon, as well as uh, Lieutenant General Al Peck. I'm glad that you are in the audience today. I'm sorry, so very sorry I'm not there with you. On the 9th of June, uh, 2021, given, having given authorization and appropriation opportunity by the Congress in National Defense Authorization Act 2021, Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin decided it was time to proceed with establishing the nation's newest DOD regional center. And this is chartering the Ted Stevens Center for Our Security Studies, charged with doing four specific uh, mission tasks. And the, those mission tasks were specifically oriented towards um, advancing domain awareness for the security practitioner. And that, of course, in for both U.S. international professionalization of Arctic service, advancing DOD's Arctic priorities, and then addressing the rules-based order of the Arctic region for security and stability. And lastly, to take a hard look at the intersection of climate and climate security to the practitioner needs in and around the Arctic region. This, of course, follows uh, the same model that was established back in 1993. In 93, after the end of the, uh, the Cold War between NATO and the Soviet Union, uh, there were a lot of NATO, a lot of Warsaw Pact nations that were trying to figure out what direction were they going to go? Were they going to fold into the Commonwealth independent states or were they going to lean west towards NATO? At the end of the Second World War, of course, the United States embarked upon the Marshall Plan for the reconstruction of Europe. In 1993, the United States, along with the Federal Republic of Germany, decided to create in the image of, uh, of the Marshall Plan a Marshall Center that would be focused on the people where the essentially challenges to bring people that were in those former leaders, those war, former Warsaw Pact nations to think West and to think about being a part of NATO. The measure of merit that the Marshall Center created back in that time was, you know, frankly, NATO in 1993 was a 17 allies. I was a young aircraft commander driving airplanes in Europe at the time myself, and I remember that. And in of course, earlier this year, uh, number 32 raised his flag on the podium there in Brussels as Sweden formally became a member of NATO. Now, the Marshall Center can claim full credit in, uh, in saying that the reason NATO has gone from 17 to 32 is because of them, but they sure as heck could say they had a contributing hand. They had more than 15,000 graduates of their programs, and uh, they were principally the, the measure of merit that all regional centers have had since 1993 is essentially growing graduates of the programs that they've been, that they've been hosting. Following on the heels of the establishment of the Marshall Center in 93, uh, Senator Daniel K. Inouye, I thought, what a great idea. How will we do something like this for the Asia Pacific? So he actually ramrodded a program uh, and an appropriation authorization through the Congress back in the 90s to create the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, APCSS. After he passed away, they finally allowed, uh, he finally allowed them to name it after him, but not before he passed away. So now today, the Daniel K. Inouye Center for Asia Pacific Security Studies, located in, in Fort Tarusi, right across from the Halekoa in Hawaii, is the nation's second uh, DOD regional center. 
There are three located in Fort McNair, uh, been supported a lot by National Defense University. The, uh, the number three was the, the, the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, now known as the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, followed by the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, followed by the Near East and South Asia Center for Security Studies. So that was finalized. Those first five were created from 93 to 2000. Then we went more than 20 years, 21 years to be exact, before the part of the fence said, yeah, we need another one. And ultimately, this is because the Congress had an inspired idea. And then the Secretary had a chance to think through it for about six months and decided to go forth and do it. Now today, of course, uh, with the establishment of DOD's newest regional center, the, the region uh, of the Arctic, which has increasingly become more important to the geostrategic equation, is, is underway being developed and we're in our terrible twos. Um, frankly, uh, that is, not, as a DOD startup, I'm, it's not the easiest thing and certainly uh, it can be trying patience to the 10th power. I had the privilege of spending uh, 30 years and change uh, in the Air Force and loving every moment of it. Um, knowing that I was going to make a zip code based decision to bring my wife back to her home country here in, in South Central Alaska. But while I was in the Air Force, I became kind of the Arctic kid a little bit along the way. Um, and specifically for on the Joint Staff, as a Joint Staff, specific J5 recidivist, although I got some time with the three as well. But in UCOM, of course, getting a chance to advance that further and uh, being a part of some of the early initiatives for the Arctic and the defense and security spaces to include participating in the Arctic Chief of Defense Forum, the very first one hosted at Goose Bay, Labrador in uh, 2013 serving as a co-chair of the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable, uh, along with my Norwegian uh, J-5 counterpart, and then ultimately doing a lot of technology work uh, in the latter stages with NORTHCOM, uh, one as the joint staff, uh, that was focused on Arctic domain awareness. And then, uh, as this crowd probably knows, with a number of Air Force folks there, and I made a zip code-based decision to, uh, to hang up my cleats or my spurs, however you want to look at it, and you come. Uh, coming back to Anchorage uh, and, and the Air Force saying, okay, remind me your home of record again. It's yes, it is Anchorage. I came in, uh, mustered as a second lieutenant back in 1985 at Elmendorf Air Force Base. So uh, when I came back here and I was going to figure out what I was going to do after uh, being um, in Air Force for, for a bit of time, uh, the Air Force, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the Chancellor of the University of Alaska Anchorage himself being retired Air Force three-star, Lieutenant General retired Tom Case, who was an icon of goodness, I remember my time in service, asked me, he said, I have a, he had a center that was having a little bit of a problem. And, uh, and that problem was perhaps uh, more akin to an airplane being in a flat spin, frankly. Um, and But uh, General Case, uh, Chancellor Case said, look, I, I could use some help. Can you help? <laughs> of course, yes, sir. My wife said, you, you said, what? Did you know what you're getting yourself into? I said, no, I have no idea I'm getting into, but I can figure out the Arctic stuff and I'll figure out research. And be honest with you, when, when a gentleman like Tom Case asks for help, then your job is to say, well, how can I? And that's the way I looked at it. So I spent uh, about 35 seconds figuring out my chapter next to a uh, decision after hanging in my spurs in the Air Force. And, and that resulted in five half years of running that center, We're going from kind of a center of not doing so well to a center really doing well. And... I uh, got that on a pathway to emeritus status and uh, under the contracts provided between the Department of Homeland Security and the University. And then I was asked by the Defense Security Cooperation HC to, to, to leap into this aspect of creating a new DoD startup when really they lost a cookbook how to do these things because it had been more than 20 years. And of course, the Department of Defense has not gotten any less bureaucracy uh, since uh, in, the, in those 20 you know, intervening years. That said, uh, the Arctic is a region that, to me, has captured my imagination since I was a young lieutenant. Uh, in fact, before I was in the, uh, you came to the Air Force, working the Army Corps of Engineers up in Alaska, uh, working on Arctic projects back in the day that kind of captured my early attention. But in B-52s and 130s and 135s, uh, as airplane drivers, I uh, got to know the air, uh, got to know the Arctic from an airplane vantage point, and knowing that the challenge of the region from the practitioner standpoint need to be addressed. But of course, today, regional centers are an instrument of within the Department of Defense's kit bag as a soft power complement to hard power investment decisions. We're focused on those things that are really left of bang. Um, and when it gets to time bang, then it's time to bring the hardware and the people you know, that are proficient in managing the hardware to affect the nation's defense. 
we are at the point of where we're trying to be able to prevent that, if you will, through better enhanced integrated deterrence, advancing Arctic literacy, advancing research analysis, and of course, engagement outreach, not just within our colleagues with ministries of defense and security, but really whole of nation internationally. We're a tool of security cooperation. And in a tool of security cooperation, we support policy. Um, I have a few slides I'm gonna bring up, but I wanna give that as kind of a little bit of a preamble. And um, we'll go through the slides, but what matters more than bloody slides is really a chance for some, for addressing your questions, your interests. But please know the United States is an Arctic nation. And as an Arctic nation, uh, we have genuine Arctic interests. Those Arctic interests start, of course, our nations, our, our, our national security interests and our citizens. We protect and defend our homelands. And ultimately, this center is actually aligned to the United States Northern Command, which is there to provide defense for the homelands and defense for civil authorities in crisis response. We're not just a North American center. We're not just an Alaskan center. We're a pan-Arctic center. Right now, working with seven of eight Arctic nations. We're not going to be working with number eight for a while because they've They've kind of chosen to go a different pathway, and we're not in the business of condoning or supporting any of those kind of actions that, that Russia has conducted specifically since uh, February 2022. But we are in the business of trying to help prevent conflict from spreading to the Arctic, enhancing the rules based order, and working with our colleagues, not just within the Department of Defense, but the U.S. Interagency and Department of State, inclusive to that, and then with allies and partners, not only across the Arctic Seven which of course is where we're putting a weathering eye. But it's also, of course, those nations have Arctic interests. For example, many nations in the European theater, and to, to the surprise of many, quite a few nations in the Indo-Pacific, for example, India, Singapore, Australia, the Republic of Korea, and Japan all have very concerted Arctic interests. In fact, some of the best Arctic researchers there are are, are scientists from, from Japan. So. The Indo-Pacific has an Arctic interest, and of course, China had made a declaration a few years ago, and I was I was in a, in an in a audience when they made one of those announcements that they part and you know, saw themselves a near Arctic state. Well, that may be true, um, and of course, then Maine will say they're a near Arctic state as well from a different vantage point. Neither are Arctic states. Yeah, Maine's not an Arctic state. No, no harm against our good colleagues in, in Maine. Certainly on the approaches to the Arctic from the from the northeastern vantage point and China uh, may declare us near Arctic, but that doesn't make you an Arctic nation. And certainly that's something that we, of course, help enforcing rules-based order include as aspects of telling truth and being honest about the security equation and also honest about the definitions. So let me bring some slides up. And I hope as I go through these, um, that you will queue up questions and we can make it more interesting um, as we go through it. But strategically, let me get this going here and then we'll crank through some view graphs for you. And uh, at least I can say view graphs in this crowd without people saying what? Um, I'm hoping anyway. So the strategic environment, of course, is a starting point here for us. And this, of course, why it matters is because the Arctic today is a place where Things are happening quickly. Um, the geophysical aspects of the Arctic have been changing quite extensively, quite quick. And I, I learned this firsthand being in the U.S. Arctic Commission, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and, and running a group of scientists uh, for a number of years and uh, as a, essentially a research administrator. The Arctic is warming about four or five times, depending what specific region you're looking at, in compared to the lower latitudes of the northern hemisphere, uh, places like uh, now ultimately places like the uh, the the polar ice cap, the cryosphere, is actually reducing in volume uh, and size extensively. Now, if you were to take a look um, in 1966 as an example, uh, the Arctic, the mean depth of ice or the thickness of ice in the Arctic. Uh, in 1966, one of those first things where first chalk lines was snapped was about eight feet. Today, the, the mean thickness of the cryosphere, Panarctic, is under four feet. And there's certainly places it continues to contract. And ultimately, we're looking at, uh, at least seasonally, a uh, very light ice season, multi-year ice being mostly gone by the year 2050, maybe sooner, depending which model you look at. And of course, that provides an incredible opportunity for maritime transportation. It provides incredible opportunity for 
folks are looking to extract mineral and, 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 and extracting natural wealth. And it also provides an opportunity for folks that are interested in, in being tourists and more to getting to an area that's historically the barrier of ice has made the maritime domain of the Arctic Basin exceedingly difficult to get to, not anymore. And certainly the project, projections hold true, even less so coming to the future. But it's still a region that every six months goes from light to dark. And I live in, in 61 degrees north latitude for the last eight and a half years. And I guarantee you that every season it gets dark and every season it gets light. And that won't change no matter what the climate does. And so at this point here, a changing climate at the same time enables the barriers of access because the changing climate is reduced. Strategic competition finds a foothold here. Of course, the Arctic Basin was a place that was a, was a posturing ground during, this, during the Cold War. It is once again a place where posturing is happening. This time, not just between this NATO and the Soviet Union, but now this time with the combination of effort with the Russian Federation, People's Republic of China, as well as other nations that are, that are plying the waters and taking advantage of the, of the loss of the barriers from the past. But we still have a region that is still set to be awful extreme. Uh, as a young crew member flying big airplanes back in the day, um, I always thought if I had to eject out over the Arctic Basin that my time of life expectancy was at maybe at best 24 hours because I was too far north and too far from help. And ultimately, if help were to come, I, would they be more in the business of recovery as opposed to rescue? Well, those extreme operating environments are still there. It's still a very difficult place to operate airplanes. It's really a difficult place to operate vessels on the surface. Pretty easier if you go operating underneath the ice. So there's, our submarine forces can do their job as they've done for many years relatively uh, easily compared to those folks that are surface or higher. But the practitioners do not only include people operating platforms, they include people that are in the ground that are equipped with the hardware in the very kinetic end of the business, such as soldiers or Marines. They're in the business of being on the ground defenders and on the ground to conduct operations. Those folks, the job has not gotten any easier. Uh, we have left the Airborne Division now, where it used to be U.S. Army Alaska, the nation's second uh, airborne Division, the 82nd horse being there at uh, Fort Liberty, formerly Fort Bragg. And then, of course, um, the folks of the 101st Air Assault, uh, they're not necessarily an Airborne Division, but it has an air to them. Well, the 11th Airborne Division, paired here at Joint Base Helmut Air Force, along with 11th Air Force, is an Arctic Force, but is really assigned to Indo PACOM, as are all you know, U, uh, U.S. forces in Alaska. They, they live at the edge of the Arctic but they're really for, for the Indo-Pacific region and they can swing north if they need to, but they're also on the hook to go south as well. These forces and, the, and learning how to be better Arctic security practitioners need to be and have enhanced uh, literacy, enhanced understanding, ultimately a number of things to benefit them as part of our mission set because we're the only DOD region center has been given the charge of not only security cooperation internationally, but also support for professionalization of U.S. Arctic surface. So when we look at national defense in the Arctic region, uh, we are looking at, of course, what's the effect to the people that call the region home to include Arctic and indigenous. And of course, these people have local place-based knowledge sets that we can learn and gain from. And this is one regional center, similar to the Inuit Center, that is focused on understanding the insights, perspectives of the people who called the, the Arctic home since time began. People like Roald Amundsen back in the day, he was one of the first folks to actually do Arctic exploration and live to tell about it because he first learned the ways of the Inuit and ultimately by studying with them, figured out how to survive and thrive in the Arctic and as opposed to just going to the Arctic and hitting the clock and seeing how much time we have left before we die from scurvy or exposure or both. When you look at today's Arctic, today's Arctic, of course, is similar, similar challenges that face explorers in times past, but Ultimately, we're now in an area where strategic competition is happening here as it is in other places. We have been charged, of course, as a regional center to focus on those things that enhance the rules-based order. So our job is to work that left of bang problem set by enhancing the rules-based order, conducting operations or supporting the conduct of operations. We're not operators ourselves, but support operations through research analysis, Arctic literacy, and an engagement outreach with allies and partners across the region and include those nations that have strong Arctic interests as well as, of course, quote, the Arctic Seven, 
I mean, thinking about the United States all the way to, to Finland. In fact, speaking of that, our region of responsibility, our region of area, our focus areas are run from essentially a little diamond island uh, in the Bering Straits to you know, east of Rovimini, Finland, essentially the, the Finnish-Russian border. And this center, even though we're new DUD startup and our terrible twos, uh, we have been operating across that mission space, literally from Western Alaska to, to Finland. Um, building partnerships and working the transatlantic Arctic Bridge in order to better understand characterization of strategic competitors, looking at what things that help us not only with domain awareness, but understanding, looking at strategic and operational risk, looking at the challenges of a changing climate to things such as permafrost and the effect it has to assets, platforms, infrastructure stability. When we look at today, of course, Arctic crisis response is constrained and enabled by effective logistics. Mostly it's a constraint and mostly it's expensive. Most of the infrastructure is pretty limited for doing large scale operations in a crisis response timeframe. Helping to understand the planners, the practitioners, so they understand essentially the constraints, the theory of constraints applied to the Arctic region is a critical piece of the equation. And then looking at what is a changing climate impact to the security and defense forces. So the ter term, you know, if you will, climate security is something we're Awfully interested in trying to advance better understanding and applications of it. We're speaking of the Arctic as a as a region where most people know it's the region of 66 and 3rd North. The, the, the top end and the bottom end is the Arctic or the Antarctic from a circle standpoint. Well, the Arctic is, of course, a lot more than just the circle of 66 and 3rd North. It's defined by different characteristics, which include, of course, uh, the, the temperature thermocline. Uh, about 50 degrees and colder is above that is equals Arctic and below that, of course, is non-Arctic. Uh, there's things such as tree lines and other as definitions as well. And there's actually a couple different quote, north poles if you look at it between magnetic and true north and more. Um, but to, to, to politically, one of the things most folks don't realize is that if you look at 66 and a third north, you're looking at a population uh, of about 4 million people and half of them being Russian. If you bump the definition of the Arctic down from 66 third north to about 60 north, as the Arctic Council has done a number of years ago, then you include, you go from about four to about 12 million people. Uh, that includes a large number of population bases, um, uh, uh, population areas in Russia, and of course the Nordics as well, large cities such as Hels uh, not only St. Petersburg, but Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo, are all in that 60, and Reykjavik are all in that 60 degree band of latitude. Anchorage here, 61 and a few degrees north here as well. So we fit in that category as well. I just say realistically, we're not in the Arctic, but we're certainly can, if I can borrow this term from Sarah Palin a number of years ago, we can see it from here. Well, maybe not quite, but I have to climb the ridge to get there. But nonetheless, the Arctic is not that far north of us. We're certainly in the southern end of it. But Something that I think most most Americans don't know, since 1984, we defined the Arctic by an act of Congress, which includes 66 and third north, everywhere but except the, the Alaska and the Bering Sea Basin. As chart shows you in 1984, Senator Frank Murkowski, yes, that's the, that's the data of, of Senator Lisa Murkowski, and Senator Ted Stevens authored the Arctic Research Policy Act, which of course enabled uh, the establishment of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC. <clears throat> Two instruments of research that benefits uh, both government and non-government to advance our, our national understanding for what's happening in the Arctic region. In that act, uh, the, the two authors decided to create a definition of the Arctic that included not only 66 and a third north everywhere else, but looking from westward at 144, uh, sorry, 140th parallel, well, oh, Meridian, got to get some coffee in me. Um, once you get past the Canadian-Alaskan border and you're looking uh, at, uh, the, you go westward to the Porcupine River and flow that down to the essentially the bearing uh, of the Bristol Bay, Norton Sound region, actually Bristol Bay region, the yukon Cuscombe River Delta, you work, or work around Bristol Bay out to the Alaska Peninsula, then inclusion of all the Aleutian Islands and then shorelines of Russia. So essentially you include this big chunk of real estate well south of 66 and third north we're talking about in the 50s uh, for north latitude when you include the Aleutian chain. And there's a similarity when we look at the terrain, it's all mostly treeless down there. 
Um, and then from our vantage point, by including, including of this of this basin in 1984, where a large portion of America's, uh, actually the most productive fishery we have in the U.S. today is essentially the Bering Sea Basin. Historically, those fish stocks have been, in the 1980s, were all towards the southern end of the ocean chain, but because of warming conditions, those fish stocks are moving further and further north. But including the Lucian chain back in 1984 gave a chance for research to be able to be conducted there under Arctic auspices in order to understand what's happening in that region that may benefit economically the state of Alaska and the nation. But wait, there's more. Okay, so when we look at geopolitics for the Arctic region, of course, as of just a few weeks ago, number 32 raised its flag on the flagpole in Brussels. Seven of eight Arctic nations are now NATO allies. And ultimately, as a former UCOM planner uh, and strategist and, and policy kid, uh, we were always worried about after when Crimea happened and we had all the problem sets on the eastern flanks of the alliance, and specifically the aspects of the challenge of the Baltic states as NATO allies, how do we help support them if, them, if Russia decides to, to play very badly and to threaten or to even worse at Crimea, that would be focused on the Baltics on NATO soil would be a big, big deal. Well, we knew that with Sweden and Finland being there in the equation, we'd have to work with them. And certainly they were, they were incredible partners, but they were not allies. And I have always worried that someday we could surely reduce the security equation of defense of the NATO alliance on the eastern flanks if, in fact, Sweden and Finland are part of the equation. Well, Mr. Putin kind of did NATO a big favor, um, by, which was an absolute tragedy in every, every definition of the term. But he did, of course... Uh, caused his actions in, in Ukraine and starting February 2022, this time two years ago, both NATO, both um, Sweden and Finland joined the side this time to join the alliance. And ultimately, we are stronger today at 32. Geographically, the northeast corner of the alliance is actually now well secured. Finland's putting in fifth generation fighters, but a whole big lot of F-35s coming into the equation. Who knows, maybe Sweden as well someday. We'll see, but because they got their own aerospace industry they're quite proud of. But you have a lot of fifth generation fighters between Norway and, and uh, Finland all there to help defend the northern, northern flanks of the alliance, northeastern corner of the alliance as well. And then ultimately, integrated deterrence is now perhaps stronger than it's been before because you brought in two really capable nations to, with a 2% GDP plan uh, for supporting uh, their contribution to NATO. It's a big deal. And of course, uh, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has challenges for the Arctic region. We ultimately, we, we hope, and by doing our job left a bang well, that today and tomorrow and every day after, you know, Mr. Putin says today, wakes up and says today is not the day to mess with the world's greatest alliance in the history of mankind. But diplomatic uh, venues, of course, matters, but so does military readiness, exercises and more to try to, you know, if you will, address rising tensions in the region, specifically the Nordic Basin um, and the Barents Sea region in particular. Those are places that we have to have a strong integrated turns to make sure though that it's not seen as overly provocative, but it is seen as strong and resolved and resilient. And then of course you're seeing where Russia and China today are operating, not as allies, but certainly an awful lot closer than they have ever in the past. Of course, Russia looks at where you look at the relationship with China. They, they're not necessarily perhaps all that happy that they're in a state where they have to kind of invite China in uh, to the into the Arctic space. They've always been pretty possessive of their of their Arctic territory and inviting China in is kind of a big deal for them. But they, they have this relationship because the sea is a counterweight to a stronger and ever more powerful NATO. So great power competition and our strategic competition is happening today in and around the Arctic Basin. Certainly for us in the western side of the Arctic, it's not as tense as, as it is in the eastern portion of the Arctic. And But nonetheless, it's the same nation. We're facing the Bering Straits as, as, as Finland is facing on their border near the Kola Peninsula. That great power competition is going to be around for a long time to come. Our job for at this center is to help the conversation the people wear the research analysis and more to reduce the chance that that tension unintentionally un, 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 un goes way up the escalation ladder way too quick. We need to be in the business of, of trying to assure our allies and deter 
aggression, uh, transarctic, transarctic, what's called the transantarctic bridge to make sure that again, th those nations that would threaten us say today's not that day. Of course, the Arctic operating environment uh, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is not easy. Uh, there's an area, a lot of where science technology can actually help the practitioners, and we're kind of one of the links to try to help translate that. So, you know, the National Science Foundation for years have done incredible research, big, heavy, thick tomes, uh, research uh, that's on shelfware in a lot of places, and it's not benefiting the um, the art practitioners as much as it should be. So some of our jobs in the research side of the equation is to really pull the shelfware off and translate it and distill it down to make it a digestible set of understandings for the practitioners. Understanding what's happening climate-wise, so the effect is to military operations, to include, of course, military investment decisions for infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, permafrost is, is um, certainly not an easy thing to contend with. The North Warning System, formerly known as the Dew Line, but the transition North Warning System in the 1980s, um, is intended to is is actually now up for for a lot of renovation. Both the United States and, and Canada have agreed to do a lot of restoration, renovation, and, and IT improvements for that the North Warning System. But some of this North Warning System is built on very poor permafrost ground is thawing, and um, ultimately the eastern portion of Canada built on rock. Rock is good on that continental shield, but western Western Canada and North Slope until all the way to swing the corner. Our shorelines in Alaska are built on frozen ground. Historically, it's been buff, buffered by shore fast ice. The frozen ground, shore fast ice was in the good old days, if you will, kept really stable ground. You didn't worry about it. Well, today, those the shore fast ice has been long gone seasonally. And then the ground is actually thawing and the thawing is thawing silt or sawing, thawing clay which is slumping and, and making heavy equipment things such as radars, not all that stable. And you don't want to have a, a radar that's wobbling all over the place based on poor ground. So trying to figure out what do we do about infrastructure decisions based on environmental risk indexes of permafrost, for example, understanding that for the practitioner and decision makers so they understand where do they need to make changes. Certainly more aspects in, in Arctic capable platforms. Of course, icebreakers, there's been a lot of dust discussion about this as a, as a presence projection. It's certainly not necessarily intended to be uh, a defense vehicle. They're, they're calling it the polar security cutters and that's a security aspect, but not a defense. I know that the, the fighter pilots in the room there would probably look at, well, a, you know, you know ultimately a, a, an icebreaker is an important aspect to pr project presence but it's a very big, slow moving, bright radar return. And ultimately it's there to be operating in the left of bang and to project presence or an integrated deterrence, but itself of course is not necessarily an asset that you really are all that intimidated by because the way it's configured. It's not like a naval vessel, which most airplane pilots say stay the heck away from naval vessels because they can hurt you really quickly at long distance. Not the case for icebreakers at this point. Now in the future, who knows, maybe they'll equip them so that they're less vulnerable. But in the end of time, at the end of the day right now, when we look at left of bang issues, icebreakers do matter. Arctic maritime security matters. Projecting power across the Arctic from a from a platform standpoint, is, of course, it's not just about fighters, it's about the refuelers that get them where they need to go in a quick time. Multi-domain awareness and understanding, as I mentioned, also infrastructure. What really does matter, though, is that how do we enhance security cooperation among NATO allies in and around the region? Not just the Arctic 7, but also other members of the Arctic Alliance, uh, of the NATO Alliance that have Arctic interests. For example, like Arctic Security Forces Roundtable that involves not only the Arctic 7, but it also involves United Kingdom, Great Britain, sorry, United Kingdom, um, Netherlands, Germany, and France. And so nations such as that have strong Arctic interests and strong military capabilities, helping them participate in Arctic efforts do matter as well. So now this is an eye chart. I'm not going to subject you to the details here, but what matters is that there's a lot of players that know a lot of stuff about the Arctic region, the U.S. federal government. Um, and because of it, there's a lot of need for connecting the dots and connecting the data. When we look at what we're doing as a center, we're looking at all these different, if you will, contributors and trying to find a way to synthesize, pull the data and pro provide this to analytics in order to be able to help 
again, the practitioners of, that are invested in Arctic defense operations. It's a big family, uh, but the thing is, as a big family, it is also a family that pretty much everyone knows everyone. Um, and that is a joy, of course, is a challenge too. It's one, the Arctic family in the U.S. is one great big small family. That pretty much everyone knows everyone. Um, but strategically, I want to transition a moment from that broad set of discussions for the Arctic and then have a discussion here a little bit about this regional center's contributions to Arctic security cooperation. Certainly, Arctic, as I mentioned, has, um, has not only Arctic 7 and 8, when you look at Russia, that have strong, permanent interest in the region. We have territory that makes the strategic aspect of the Arctic job one, defense of our sovereign territory, our sovereign interests, and our, and our citizens that call the place home. Duty Regional Center, of course, is that soft tool, uh, a soft power tool in the kit bag of the department that works in partnership with Hard Power Gang. And in this, we're in the with business about international venues for bilateral, multilateral research, communications, exchanging ideas, convening programs with both military folks and non military folks internationally. And as it were, tool security cooperation, Section 342 of Chapter 16, Title 10, U.S. Code. And in there, all six DOD regional centers have this vested interest to conduct practitioner-focused research, practitioner-focused executive education, and then also the business of conducting engagement outreach across the region. Uh, this is a startup for us. We're in our terrible twos right now, located at Joint Base Home of Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, inhabiting a schoolhouse made in 1954 for elementary kids and yes, my office is the principal's office. And when I was in elementary school, I didn't have a very good relationship with my principal. So I kind of have a little bit of little bit of uh, issues walking through the door to my office, knowing that this, at least this time I'm not going to be dealing with a piece of wood that may be warped around my backside. But strategically, these soft power complements are there to actually help the people wear part of the problem set as the Marshall Center was first found to do. Again, each of our regions have the same approach. And each of us are configured a little bit differently. In fact, my dear colleague, another Terrier Force Two star that runs the that Marshall Center, said we're all each handmade wooden shoes. Well, that's a good European vantage point uh, to be sure. But we are all uniquely configured for our regions, and that actually gives a unique opportunity for our Line Northern Command, which is U.S. Northcom, but also U.S. European Command and U.S. Indo-Pacific Command to leverage us to things that matter to them. As a DoD startup, though, we are we are uh, in our terrible twos. We're in route to being fully operational. We plan to do so by about the 30 September, the conditions based approach. Uh, two years ago, uh, in this in March of 2022, we had a total of three DoD civilians in the center. Um, we're uh, and then a small contract team. Today, our overall population as a center has gone from three DoD civilians to um, we're over 30 DOD civilians and uh, with a contract team that's about 14 plus Department of State to U.S. Coast Guard and more. We will be shortly uh, to 40 DOD civilians by the latter part of the summer and in route to a size of about 65 people writ large uh, and but with an adjunct network of about 190 folks that are connected to our center and that's literally across the Arctic region. As a DoD startup, we've already created uh, people wear programs have generated more than 1500 graduates uh, of our programs all done online because we started in COVID and we kept doing that until our centers refurbished. Uh, we'll do our first in-person and hybrid approach, if you will, for education this summer. We have fun field of the Arctic Research Orientation course, Arctic Multiband Legal course. We've conducted a number of Arctic security primers. Arctic climate security dilemmas and more. Uh, we have uh, understanding Arctic industry, technology and energy course in final stage development. We have understanding Arctic crisis logistics, uh, Arctic domain awareness security practitioner and understanding Arctic operational risk are all part of a 24 course planned curriculum that we're on the in route for building, uh, that we're underway building. We have about 35 research tasks we're tackling. We're part of the International Cooperative Engagement Program for Polar Research. And then we've conducted from field programs all the way to a large uh, symposiums uh, ourselves. And that includes getting people, including the DOD, sorry, including the Department of State and their colleagues 
Arctic senior officials out on snowshoes in the Chugach Mountains here in Anchorage just last year and getting ready to do another Arctic practitioner and engagement program into the environment uh, here in just a few days with a number of Europeans and Canadians that, that, that talk about the Arctic but haven't really spent time in conditions that replicate the Arctic. We, for the Army folks in the room, we use the Point Barrow, Alaska. It's kind of our jump talk. It was a place to conduct at the Barrow Arctic Research Center. Practitioner focused in, in our educational venues, seminars in the Arctic region. Uh, we've coasted a, a large 400 person size Arctic Symposium two years ago. We're creating what's called the Arctic, the Anchorage Security and Defense Seminar and Conference. Uh, going to be done on an annual basis here in Anchorage. It has a window to the Pacific and a window to the Arctic. And uh, borrowing some aspects of what we've done in the past, but also bringing in ministerial level folks as well. So who we are is uh, we're working across that that community of people that give a darn about the Arctic from both the U.S. and Allied standpoint. We do conduct a different kind of programs that I mentioned to include, of course, digital program just getting on its legs and, uh, and alumni dialogues to follow. And then, of course, why? Well, of course, if you start with why, you realize it's about enabling people to have better understanding about the Arctic region. We, of course, also, um, most folks don't know, but each of these centers used to be working. Uh, in fact, when I was UConn J518, uh, we worked extensively. Uh, the Marshall worked through UConn. In fact, you know, my job for when General Brela was the commander of US UConn at the time, and also SAC here, and my job was to look after the Marshall Center as part of my JOB there in order to help preserve time and space for the commander to not have to worry about it. Um, but then in 2016, uh, the DOD realigned the regional centers from the combatant commands to the Office Secretary of Defense. So my direct boss is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Hemisphere Affairs. We're aligned to General Guillaume uh, at uh, U.S. NORTHCOM, NORAD, and then executive agencies provided to us by Defense Security Cooperation Agency. And of course, uh, since we're enshrined in law and under security cooperation, that makes an awful lot of sense. To do what? Okay, and this is about being about the Arctic across the Arctic uh, in every venue you can. It's a place that also, if, if, you, if you've not been into the Arctic, you don't really understand the Arctic. So part of our business is getting people to feel what the Arctic, you know, get where the Arctic actually feels like. And that, of course, means uh, being out where your face hurts, and your hands hurt, and everything's cold. But it's not like that all the time. Sometimes it's like you're, how to cope with about a billion mosquitoes. Well, that's what the netting and deets for. Um, and I think people don't realize that the Arctic is a very harsh place. Um, and ultimately, you can't have appreciation for how a good job done unless you've actually been out in the region. And I remember flying up there a long time ago, dealing with a lot of rime ice and other things that made that we got pretty dangerous pretty quick. And barometer settings on the on the on the altimeter that were we'd had to put the cheat sheet in because we couldn't get the barometer or the, the the window in the in the altimeter to go higher or lower because the pressure differences are that much significant. So understanding that practitioner challenge is something we are bringing building our center to do. And and as a startup, we don't have a center filled with Arctic experts yet, but we're working on it. We are also growing our, our essentially a new generation of security practitioners in the center as well and becoming more fluent to the challenge of the region. But these activities I've identified for you, not only, of course, the business of people getting out and learning uh, through different venues, but also digital programming. And we've actually uh, have the first DOD Regional Center professional journal we've committed to called the Journal of Arctic Climate Security Studies. So journal, journal, journal number one edition was out in the fall. Journal number two is in short final for delivery here within the next few weeks. It's under final reviews. And then journal number three will be out in the fall, the first three experimentals, just to, you know, from the time we got started to the time we get fully operational. Again, we're looking about 30 September for that. You can go to our website at www.tedstevenscenterarccenter.org and see all there, there is that we have posted out there. And as a DOD startup, of course, we're still learning as we go. We're building while doing. And again, we're using the tools of innovation experimentation. Lastly, we need to be as a, as a calcified center in these early days. But we're in our terrible too. So I remember when I went from 13 to 14 years of age, I was about, I grew about eight inches in one year and I could barely walk through the door without falling over myself. Well, that's kind of where we're at right now, but we're getting there. So by the summer, we'll kind of get most of the folks uh, in in good set and, and calibrate underway. But it is a joy to build and do. And ultimately, the easiest thing for us to have done would have been to create a center, 
get everything all set before we put it in play. But that would have delayed the Department of Defense three years um, from the time we got started before we did anything of relevance. At this point, we could say that we've been building and doing despite the challenges that we've been able to get good things done to benefit national security, defense and security with more to come as we've learned along the way. Our enduring conditions as opposed to end state is really about advancing awareness. It's really addressing the priorities of the department uh, in the Arctic region, which includes, of course, what was enshrined in 2019, but getting ready to make a shift as the new DODR strategy comes out the door here in the next few weeks. Programs that reinforce the rules-based order of the Arctic is what we're about, including an event we're doing, uh, one we did last year in New Greenland, another one we're hosting in uh, Equalwit uh, uh, Nunavut uh, in Baffin Island uh, in Canada here coming up here in the spring. Um, and then ultimately being a part of NORTHCOM and Indopaycom and UCOM when it comes to our programs being leveraged as overall campaign, particularly with NORTHCOM. And then we're still working to create understanding of Arctic climate security to the aspect of the security practitioner. So when we looked at the opportunities for collaboration, of course, anyone in this area has an Arctic uh, bent to them, want to write, come on along. We will happily take a look at your work and put it through peer review and put it in our journal. We, of course, uh, our research analysis is not only just that, but also the ice paper program, as, as I mentioned earlier, and then ultimately creating a number of strategic uh, special reports that are uh, focus areas of Arctic research tasks. We, of course, can do from death studies to modeling. We're not in the business of RDD and E. So now that we don't have to, with the research we do, we're not going through the Valley of Shadow Death from research capabilities. We're, we're working in research for fundamental and analytical support to practitioners and policymakers. We do, of course, a number of, uh, as I mentioned, more than two dozen courses in development. We've already, have we got two fielded and, and actually three fielded. We have a number more in development. And then ultimately, we not only just, uh, if you will, host uh, and conduct, but we also invite. We have, uh, again, about 187 adjuncts that are associated with our center at this point that are Arctic A-listers. Uh, everyone here, if you have a security bent need you're, and you can join online, you go to our website, you can register for the course. We're already at 200 for the next Arctic Research Orientation course. Uh, it, the, this keeps growing, growing, growing. We've tried to constrain it. We said, let's live with 100. And I said, well, let's live with 130. Now, then 150. Now, we're trying to see if we can swing 200 this next go. I don't know if we can do it, but we're going to try. Of course, strategic engagement is um, we've got True North, Arctic Connections, our webinar program coming out. And we, of course, are both in LinkedIn and X, or on Twitter. And again, uh, the digital program, we have one of our colleagues here that I think is going to be the talk show host of the Arctic region. If he gets everything squared away here in the next few weeks, hopefully by May with his our, our studio will be set so he can actually get underway and, and operate the microphone like any radio talk show host would want to do. Um, so let me just bring these slides down and uh, give a chance for you to maybe ask what questions you might have. I hope most of that came through, um, but I'll address any, any understandings that I didn't clarify. And here's my whole point. The Arctic is an area that that really does matter for our national interest. Uh, I know Jay Leno was doing back in the day those, um, you know, what do you know about the Arctic region? Most people say, isn't that the spot next to Hawaii in the map? And well, no, it's not quite. It's, it's just the misunderstandings of our nation um, are really quite, um, quite profound. Uh, we're a small uh, and growing center. Um, and let me just say that uh, our budget is uh, it within the budget dust category for the Department of Defense. We look at uh, 700, 700 plus billion dollars. We are at uh, the $12 million category. So we are definitely in the rounding error of the department. So it's a low dollar, high impact, soft power out element. Um, and it's a privilege to serve uh, in this capacity. And frankly, I have no professional desire left to do other than get the center on a step. And then I, I would happily walk those throttles back and cheer other people on as the center moves on to the future and I can just cheer from the sidelines. Okay, with that, I'll bring it to close and fights on for your Q and A. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and we'll start here, uh, the way we've uh, traditionally done this is question in the room and then a question in our online audience. So. Uh, in the room, uh, a question here. 
Right, right in the back. Jake Camber. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, General. Uh, I, I'm glad to see that we're looking at the Arctic in a, a very uh, strategic way now. I read an article a week ago, I don't know if you saw it, uh, in um, uh, Defense One by the former Deputy Secretary of Defense for East Asia, a um, man named, if I'm getting it right, um, Eno Klink, I think it is. Um, and he congratulated the Pentagon and the State Department and so forth for being interested in the Arctic. But his point was now, please look at the Antarctic in the same way. And the reason for that, he said, was that uh, Russia and China are already involved in, in Antarctica in a very significant way. The rest of the world is not because we've taken the 1959 uh, treaty very seriously. Russia and China haven't, evidently. Uh, China has just established a base uh, in Antarctica that has uh, signal intelligence uh, capability. I know Australia and New Zealand are very worried about it. Um, they uh, are also uh, involved in other steps that the article brings out. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping in uh, 2014 announced that China planned to be a great power, power for both uh, Antarctica and the, and the Arctic. Russia has a 2030 plan uh, that has many military implications. They already have Russian businesses in Antarctica flying um, uh, uh, what do you call it? the um, nah. uh, 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 little things that uh, <laughs> drones, thank you. Yes, drones, okay. that's what it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, military capable drones, and uh, and they uh, are also doing other things. So, I guess my question is Is there any way that that your center can help? Um, bring out the need for a two-polar look at things or can help in any way or is was that column just totally out of out of order thanks no it's a great question so thank you for that so another if i can if i could summarize obviously um is there a dod regional center that's focusing on antarctica and i'll tell you at this point no now, obviously, the, the United States has made policy decisions in, in Washington, D.C. that has kept our national focus to Antarctica aligned to the treaty. We have been very, you know, first, the nation, the nation says and does what it does. And the policy decisions have been made for the nation, the United States, to keep our national interest focus on Antarctica to that of science. The National Science Foundation largest portion of their budget or a big a big chunk of their budget anyway uh, goes to Antarctic research there's um back in the day with the US Transportation Command when I was a young major there I was uh, invested with how to help make the transition from the Department of the Navy the Department of the Air Force for executive agency for support the National Science Foundation how to do it from a mobility and transportation vantage point um, we have stayed, we stayed by the 1959 treaty. Of course, that comes up for renewal next decade. And the discussions now are, are now at the point. So now what is the national response going to be? Our national policy and priorities going to be when it comes to Antarctica and this treaty renewal? I can't tell you where that's going to go. Uh, I will tell you that right now, if asked, we'll happily add that to our mission set. Uh, but right now, our mission authorities was that of the, uh, specifically by the Congress focus on the Arctic. There is an aspect, of course, security uh, for Antarctica is the same kind of context as security at the Arctic Council. Arctic Council doesn't do security. Uh, the senior Arctic officials uh, have uniformly, uh, and that includes all Arctic eight and then six Arctic indigenous communities or representatives that are part of the Arctic Indigenous Secretariat, all together have said the Arctic Council is not a place for security and defense discussions. 
that same mindset has been within the United States about Antarctica. I know that I've spoken to our colleagues in Australia about this because they look at the Arctic region to see how they apply with half of the Arctic to the Antarctic. And I'll tell you right now, our colleagues in Canberra are very concerned about what China is doing and uh, into the uh, Arctic, Antarctic Basin and Antarctica properly, as well as, of course, the nation of Chile. They look at Antarctica as a place that is going to be a more a rising intensity of, of interest, not just the continent itself, but the South Polar Seas, where China historically has been uh, sucking down all the krill they can, which is once upon a time considered a limitless, uh, no limits basin of krill that no, no entity could get at. That equation is no longer holds fast. You now China's interest in the Antarctic Basin or the South Polar Seas um, are quite impressive because they're managed to get a vacuum cleaner off, off, off and run an awful lot of krill. So in sum, policy decisions have to be made. If we're asked, we'll certainly serve, but ultimately that's a decision for Washington, D.C. Will they, will they want to have security part of the conversation there? I don't know. If they do, we'll be ready. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, I'll turn to you and your audience for a next question. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Jim Hardin asked the first question online. Um, uh, I think you have answered this in part since he, since he typed it in. What's your annual budget and what benefit does the U.S. Department of Defense get uh, from that uh, budget? And well, thank you. Uh, right now, it's a matter of record. Um, our budget in year one was $10 million. And then we have been living the last two years. Uh, in fact, our fiscal 24 budget was just approved, thanks to the Congress and signed by the president just uh, this last weekend. Um, we're at $12.1 million, and that's a matter of record. Uh, and that, of course, is that pays for everyone. Uh, so we don't have people and a budget separately. Everything we have in that budget includes everything. So facilities, people, and more. So it's a, we have about uh, two thirds, uh, plan about two thirds of our budget goes for paying people, one third and, and facilities, and one third goes for programs. And that's fairly similar to the other regional centers. But in this, what does the nation get for it? At this point, uh, more than 1,500 people who graduated from the programs we developed and conducted. Um, certainly a number of program security cooperation across the Arctic region. Building Arctic literacy, building Arctic cooperation, and then building Arctic analytics. So the nation gets uh, a security cooperation focused enterprise that reinforces the rules-based order of the Arctic, advances Arctic literacy and understanding, and then ultimately serves to help provi provide a, a piece to the integrated defense equation for pretty low budget costs, considering that that whole budget includes paying humans to do this kind of work and operate at a location to conduct the travel and more, as well as hosting. So the nation gets a center similar to the other regional centers that's focused on a region that is a source of expertise that can be drawn from in planning, policy, analytical decision-making, and more. That's what the nation gets, and ultimately, thank you taxpayers for, for helping fund organizations like this. If we do our job right, then hopefully the kinetic folks can be more like Maytag repair people. Another question in the room? Yes, Scott. Yeah, thank you for, for the discussion. Uh, it seems like uh, for uh, like the last few decades, you hear people talk about climate change and how the Ar Arctic will become navigable from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And I realized as you were talking, I don't know where we are. I don't know if that is so or if that's mm -hmm. due to happen soon. Uh, and if so, how does that affect um, security from your perspective? That's a great question. If you're, uh, and, and of course I'm a pilot, not a not a mariner. Uh, so the, 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 as a pilot, the, the Arctic has always been navigable. <laughs> But from the Mariner vantage point, um, the you know, up and you know, let me just give you some snapshots. Um, in uh, 1970, I think I may have the date wrong. I should be able to pull this up. The gold, you know, we had obviously it was 66 when bear when oil was discovered in uh, Prudhoe, and it's large scale strike. 
Um, a couple of years later, they had the first to call the golden barrel. They decided they're going to ship that golden barrel from Prudhoe uh, to port in eastern U.S., I think New York. Um, that golden barrel had to negotiate the Northwest Passage, um, and they realized that trying to do that required heavy ice breaking, and they got there, but it took them a, a quite a while and a lot of work. They realized at that point that so we're going to have to build a pipeline because we're never going to get oil to market this way. Um, so they made the pipeline, and obviously 1970s, the great boon, uh, boom for Alaska, boon, boon to the economy and more. Uh, but that's because the climate at the time did not allow for any other way to get the oil to market. Today, of course, the cryosphere, uh, they reached this lowest point, I think, in recorded history in the year 2012. It's bounced somewhere in that ballpark, but ultimately has not had a seismic shift further downward at this point. Um, but the projections, if you look at uh, all the different models, and I spent a lot of time looking at those, um, especially when I was doing research administration and, and being on the research commission, um, strategically, the cryosphere, they they anticipate not later than the year 2050, probably much, much sooner than that, depending on which model you look at, that you can navigate pretty much a very light or ice-free Arctic basin transpolar route in that time frame. My respect for guess is that this probably going to be well left of that. But again, that's only for a season, because when, once it gets dark, it gets cold again. And once it gets cold again, the ice reforms. But there is a couple different geophysical dynamics in play. For example, the, the Nordic region has been much, much less cold than the portion of, that I've been playing around for a number of years now. And because ultimately the Gulf Stream has brought tropical warmth to the Nordic countries via, via the, the from the Gulf of Mexico and, and the Caribbean. Now that Gulf Stream is a pretty good, and I've seen this from the air, firstly, um, it's a pretty good movement of warm water northward. Well, they're saying that this this uh, this is maybe slowing down a bit. If that Gulf Stream slows or it reduces in volume, you could see a cooling uh, in the the Nordic region. On the other hand, um, right now, for for a long time, there's been a cold pool underneath the cryosphere of about uh, historically been about a thousand feet in the Arctic basin. The Arctic is about uh, is about 4,000 feet deep is kind of a, a mean depth of basin. That thousand foot thick cold pool, historically known for, for decades and really generations, is now getting much less so. That warm water from the Gulf Stream is getting closer to the surface. And if that water, as it goes under the ice cap, if that water gets to the surface, then goodbye, Mr. Cryosphere. It's not going to be around. It's going to, the ice pack will go away and until that water subsides again and cold water is reestablished over the top, which could be, if you look at, at Greenland, there, if you have a lot of melting from Greenland, you could see a lot of cold water be put right on the top again. So there's so many dynamics can play right now. And, and I'm not a geophysicist. I'm just a plain old math major from Oregon State back in the day. Um, strategically, though, there's because of all these variables, anyone's modeled guess is certainly at this point a heuristic, not a, not a, not a proven fact. It's a heuristic, and people are going to have some guesstimates with that heuristic to get it somewhere right. Anyway, so if you're to hack a watch, say 2050, maybe we'll see. It just depends. There's so much dynamic in play. It's going to be hard to actually hack a watch and make it so. But I hope that gives you some some elements of the dynamics in play here. I would probably think you can swing it in 2050. You may be able to do it sooner, but something may change that equation altogether. Back to you, Waldo. Uh, yeah, great, great, great answer. Great question. Great answer. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Uh, for you, yes. Um, to what degree and in what way would Russia and China seek to? Uh, change the rules-based international order in the Arctic. What are their particular interests in overturning the existing international order? Well, the Arctic is just one part of play. So you got to, you really got to, you got to make that a global equation uh, to get at the answer. Either. The Arctic is just one, one theater play for, especially from the Chinese vantage point. You know, the, their Belt and Road Initiative, which has been well advertised and well, well, well discussed for a number of years now, 
is their playbook saying they want to essentially want to change the, the, the U.S. or the NATO, the Western de definition of the rules-based order and play it uh, to a Chinese tune. Um, personal perspective, okay? So in this regards, though, that China's viewpoint of the Arctic is, is not as a zone of opportunity. They're not necessarily wedded to success here. They see the Arctic as a, as a region of opportunity. They're in the business of trying to acquire resources. They want they want to control the rare earth mineral market. They would like access to marine proteins. They want access to port structure and more. I kind of think though that China by itself has had this high water mark uh, in the in the Arctic region, uh, and that's been I think they're a little bit lower in their influence and impact because I think most of the, the, the nations of the Arctic minus Russia are on to the Chinese game. I do believe that, of course, that includes uh, how much of an impact they've had to try to make into the United States. Um, there wasn't that long ago where the uh, the premier of China met with a former governor of ours here in Anchorage to talk about how China could actually help create uh, the building of a natural gas pipeline. Because for a generation or so now, natural gas that came up with oil in the Prudhoe region, it's just been stuck back in the ground. So there's trillions of cubic feet of natural gas ready for the taking, but the problem is, is getting it to market. And it would take a natural gas pipeline or some other solution to get it from Prudo to market. China was ready to get involved with that, a 55 plus billion dollar project. And now obviously that effort by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Xi with our former governor, Bill Walker has actually gone on the rocks, of course, because I don't think any governor or any elected leader in the United States is going to say, yeah, sign me up to a Chinese and Chinese sponsored construction program. It's all going to, be going to be all fine. Same aspect goes across Canada and the Nordic countries. So when you look at Russia and China today, of course, China has found a, com you know, a, a compliant partner uh, in, in with Russia. And they, of course, built out a ton of infrastructure in the Amal Peninsula, which is east of the Kola Peninsula, in uh, on the shorelines of, of of Arctic Russia, they have built up a tremendous natural gas gas liquefaction plant uh, that they're running now. Natural gas uh, tankers from Yamal across the Northern Sea route to market in in China. China, of course, wants to continue making the investment, of getting the gas at really cut rate deal. But they built infrastructure and and Russia going along with it. So that's kind of the economic side. If you think China in the Arctic equals economics and access, Russia, of course. Historically, Russia's looked at the Arctic as their frozen backstop that allows them to look face east, south, and west. But because the, the rear has been secure, so it allowed them to focus elsewhere, but their back was always fine. Well, in a changing Arctic conditions, well, now they got to look lobster out. They got to look north as well, because at this point, their secure backstop is no longer frozen and stable. So because of it, Russia has got a little bit of their own security issue. They built a lot of, uh, refurbished a lot of Soviet, former Soviet bases, put in a few new ones. Now their their Russian constructions, their construction may not be all that good. You know, I've, and I've seen this firsthand being a wing commander in, in Kyrgyzstan, spending a lot of time flying airplanes across the former Warsaw Pact region back in the day, and even do, doing treaty flights in Church Mavo back, back even in, in, that, in the 90s time frame. So strategically, Russia's efforts to build things into the Arctic region is not necessarily going to last a long time, but they put a lot of money and manpower against it. So today, China and Russia are working to not necessarily cross purposes, but not necessarily in cooperative purpose, certainly not align. They have done some things in the aviation zone. They've actually done some maritime patrols somewhat jointly, not the way we in NATO or the West would do it, but that's what they, they've done, what they thought was the right way to do it. Today, of course, Russia is actually looking at uh, in how to manage this relationship as a rheostat, I think, this personal reflection with China, so that they actually feel like they have some sovereign control when it comes to Chinese interventions in the Arctic region. I don't know how well Mr. Putin's going to be able to manage that, because I think China has bigger interests and bigger appetite and bigger capabilities than, than Mr. Putin can control. So is he become a Russian? Uh, uh, is the Russian going to become more of a vassal state to the Chinese? I don't think so, but certainly it's not one where they're equal partners. Uh, if you you got a senior partner, junior partner, and they're trying to do the best they can to manage that. And I think that both of them are working to perhaps different purposes, somewhat aligned, but somewhat different too. I hope that makes sense. Thank you.
Fantastic. General Key, I know that uh, you've got another obligation and uh, we've taken a, a great deal of your time. I want to thank you uh, personally on behalf of the council for uh, an incredibly comprehensive, uh, broad reaching uh, analysis, uh, certainly increased our awareness uh, and the work you're doing, uh, we applaud. Uh, please uh, look at us as a Southern outpost for you. Uh, if we can uh, help in any way with uh, our collaboration. And one more time, big round of applause for General Key. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. Thanks very much, my friends. And to, to you, Waldo, and to General Peck and others, thank you for the gift of your time and attention. I'm grateful for it. Have a good Not one. here. Thank you. And I remind everybody uh, that. Uh, Right now, if you would just 30 April and 14 May, if you would circle those dates on your calendar, uh, and we'll get to you with more details on the programs uh, to follow. Thank you again for coming out and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thanks.